And this week, we're going to talk about another character, another forgotten life in the Bible. And we're going to look at the life of a gal by the name of Abigail. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but when the Bible uh, talks about wisdom, it always personifies wisdom as a she. I'm going to read a couple passages to you. It says, Proverbs 120, wisdom shouts in the street. She raises her voice in the public square. Proverbs 3, 13 and 14, blessed is a person who finds wisdom and one who obtains understanding for her profit is better than the profit of silver and her produce better than gold. And all the gals said... Hey man, all the guys said, Amen. if you're smart, that's why wisdom is a she, because guys, I'm just helping you out a little bit here. You know, oh, oh, yes, <laughs> amen, whatever. Um, wisdom is she. I, I don't know how many times in my life where uh, Heidi has saved me. Uh, I can say this, I know that there are many, many times when Heidi has pulled me back from the ledge of doing something maybe that wasn't so wise, maybe it was a little bit rash. I can think of instances where I wanted to, perhaps something happened and, and I was mad about it and, I, and I'm like, I'm going to do this! And Heidi's like, man, that, that is not smart to do that. And I'm like, but I want to do it! And she's like, but, but that... That is not a good idea. They're going to think, like, you have nothing to gain if you do that, and they're going to think you're a jerk. And I'm like, well, I am a jerk. And I want them to know that I am a jerk, and that's okay with me. I, I want to. And she's like, no, man, just don't do that. And so how many of you can be thankful that wisdom is a she and thankful for people in your life who have wisdom, who are able to pull you back from the ledge. And I am so thankful that uh, in my life, I have Heidi to, to help me in those moments where I may lack wisdom and understanding, but she can see maybe a little differently and helps me to have a greater understanding of what to do and perhaps more importantly at times, what not to do. And so, you know, this morning we're going to look at the story of Abigail. And if you, I want to put you back kind of like into a Wild West scenario. And David recently, uh, the, the prophet Samuel has passed away. David goes to the south of Israel in a place called Paran. He's got his, his mighty men that we talked about in week number one, this tag, ragtag group of 400, what became unbelievable soldiers, uh, disciplined over time, and they start getting some victories. And they're out there, they're fighting battles, their, their renown is growing, their discipline and battle is growing. They're actually in a tremendous fighting force by this time. And they go to the south in Perrin, and they kind of... Um, start guarding the sheep, so to speak. So what was happening, it's a little bit like the Wild West Territory, and you would have raiders come in, and they would raid uh, people's flocks, and they would steal, and they would plumage, uh, and, and they would take from those who had. And so David, on the south of Israel, is kind of setting up as like a protective force. He's kind of like, he's the good guy. Uh, he's making sure that people aren't coming in and stealing from the flocks, and it happens that he is protecting uh, a guy by the name of Nabal's flocks on this south side. And it was a custom thing that when you were giving protection for someone's flocks that over the course of time, that eventually you'd come to the place where like, okay, let's kind of, uh, we've, we've made sure you had no losses. We made sure that, that uh, everything was protected, your men were protected, everything was good, and then they would reconcile and just go to the person and say, hey, we, we were doing this for you guys, kind of providing a service for you, uh, a protective service, and you know, would you share some of the spoils of what you have? And so in this story, we have David, we have this guy by the name of Nabal, who Abigail happens to be his wife, and Nabal, the Bible says, his name even means he's a fool. And so Nabal was rich, he was well-to-do, and Nabal was a jerk. And how many know sometimes just money amplifies who you already are? In this case, Nabal was a jerk, and his power and his resources amplified how he treated people. And there came a point in time where David, after protecting and making sure nothing was lost, uh, sent a couple of his guys 
to see Nabal and to just say, hey, you know, I know you're having a big party. They were having a shearing party. Evidently, those are pretty wild and crazy. And so big festival, big shearing festival as you do. And they were partying it up, getting ready. And David's like, this is the perfect time to go and see if we can't uh, get some kind of payback for what we've been able to do in providing. And so he sends a couple of his guys in and they, they talk to Nabal and say, hey, we've been pro providing protection. You've had no losses. Your men liked us. We liked your men. Talk to them. It was a great setup. How about now you kind of, uh, in on the name of your humble servant, uh, David, from the line of Jesse, that you would give us some goods to kind of repay us for what we have done for you. And the response is a very naval response. It was not kind. Uh, it was it was rude. It was diminishing. It was disrespectful. It was dishonoring to who David was, and more importantly, who David was becoming, going to be anointed already to be the king of Israel. And so we're going to take a look uh, in this story. Uh, through 1 Samuel 25. If you have your Bible, you can, you can take a look and turn it to 1 Samuel 25. If you don't, uh, you can check out the screens above, and we're going to read through uh, some of the passages here. Let's pray before we do that, and, and we'll get moving. Father, we just thank you for today. I do pray that you would anoint our ears to hear and our hearts to receive that which you have for each and every one of us today. God, we thank you that today, for each and every one of our lives, you know exactly what we are facing. You know exactly what we need, and I do pray and declare that, that what you want to do, Lord, that, that seed that you will sow will not return empty. It will not return void. God, we know that it is powerful and it is true that your word is like a double-edged sword dividing soul and spirit. And so we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn. It's 1 Samuel chapter 25. We're going to begin at verse number two. And this is a little bit of the story. Um, now, there was a man in Moen, a Maon, whose business was in Carmel. And the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealing, and he was a Calebite. In other words, he came from the line of Caleb. Uh, which Caleb, Joshua and Caleb, who were the only two who went into the promised land. And when Caleb got his land, now Nabal uh, sounds like doesn't have the character of, of uh, Caleb, but he, he does have, uh, he is in the lineage of Caleb. Now let's, let's take a look in uh, verse two and then four through nine. It says, it came about while he was sharing his sheep in Carmel that David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was sharing his sheep. So David, David sent 10 young men and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel and visit Nabal. Greet him in my name, and this is what you shall say. Have a long life, peace to you. Very kind, by the way. Listen to this. Have a long life, peace to you, and peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now then, I have heard that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us. We have not harmed them, nor has anything of theirs gone missing all the days they were in Carmel. Uh, ask your young men and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at hand to your servant, not even a demand, just an open invitation of opportunity uh, to and to your son, David. When David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal in accordance with all these words of David's name, and then they waited. Now, here's a lesson for all of us in relationship. And this, this series today, or this message today, is gonna, gonna give us some clues into our interpersonal relationships. Sometimes it could be in, a, in an employment context relationship, relationship with people, uh, and, and understanding how we should perhaps behave and how we should not perhaps behave. The first lesson for us is this, that a haughty response will always lead to trouble. And what we are about to see is response from Nabal that is arrogant, it is haughty, it is diminishing, it is disrespectful, and here we go. Uh, 25 verses 10 through 12, it says this, but Nabal answered David's servant and said, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men whose origin I do not know? 
So David's young men made their way back and returned, and they came and informed him in accordance to all of these words. So David came with kind words, with having done a, a, a kind service to Nabal and requested open-ended, didn't demand, he probably could have demanded, hey, give us some stuff because if you don't, this is gonna happen to you. Didn't do any of that. It comes with just a, a, a pure motive and, and uh, kind words, peace to you, peace to your house, peace to everything you have. And his response from Nabal is, well, who are you? Now, Nabal knew who he was, by the way. There was no question he knew who David was this was an insult, and maybe he was a Saul loyalist, who knows? Saul had a, a monument to himself built in Carmel, but he is saying to David, I don't care, I can't, I'm a Calebite. Look at all that I have. Who are you? Why should I bother giving you anything? Absolutely a devastating, haughty response, and I promise you, any time that we look in, at, and look at other people in a haughty way, in an arrogant way, it does not please our Heavenly Father's heart. Listen to this, Psalm 138, verse 6 says, For the Lord is exalted, yet he looks after the lowly, but he knows the haughty from afar. In other words, God opposes the proud, the haughty in spirit, those who look at other people and think, I'm better than you, and so why should I bother? And that's exactly what Nabal, Nabal thought that he, because of his stature, because of his resources, because of what he had, that he was just like, I'm better. I don't need to, what David, go away. Don't bother with me. Why should I give you dogs anything? And so his guys go, okay, we, we're, we're gonna go back. Matthew 23, 12 says this, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. I just want to encourage all of us in our personal and interpersonal relationships that we are, are very sure to not have a haughty spirit, to not look at other people uh, in a way that diminishes them and tries to elevate us. That is, that is not a godly characteristic. That is a naval characteristic. And I promise you, it doesn't serve him well in the end. And here's the second caution in a story like this. Don't be rash. Be careful of a rash and reactionary response. Now, David's response in this, when his men come back to him, is like he, David is a passionate man. David is filled with passion. He's an incredible warrior. He is a poet. He's a lot of things. He will be a great king one day, but he is a passionate individual. And when he hears the way that his men were disrespected and treated, he explodes on the inside. He says, all right, that's it. We're going to go and we're going to destroy Nabal and we're going to kill everything, everything of his household. The same guy who went to Nabal in peace and said, peace to you, peace to your house, peace to everything you have. Now in response to this moment of, of dis, that Nabal gives him, he's like, okay, it's not going to be peace to you. It's going to be destruction to you, destruction to your house and destruction to everything you have. So we have to be careful of a rash and emotional response. Now, I want to contrast really quickly for you what happened in, in chapter 24, just prior to this entire story. This is kind of a pause between the Saul and David saga. Saul is in pursuit of David, always trying to kill David, trying to, to keep him essentially because of his jealousy uh, of David. And he knew that David was anointed to be the king and he was the present king. He knew he was in trouble. And so he was trying to kill David time and time and time again. Well, in chapter 24, David has an opportunity to kill Saul. And it's a beautiful contrast to what we see in a reaction to Nabal. What, what David does in the cave is that he, he actually shows tremendous restraint and he doesn't kill Saul when he has the opportunity. And yet one chapter later, one story later, here we have David with an opportunity to show restraint, but he's choosing, no, I'm, this guy has uh, insulted me. He's insulted my name, he's insulted my men, and he will pay a price. And so passion gets the better of him. Listen to this in uh, verse 13. Then David said to his men, each of you strap on your sword. So each man strapped on his sword, and David also strapped on his sword, and about 400 men went up behind David, while uh, 200 stayed with the baggage. Listen, Proverbs 18, 19 says this, a brother wronged is more unyielding than a fortified city. Disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. 
Listen, I know there will be plenty of times in your life and in mine where we have the opportunity to be rightfully offended. Where people say something, do something, maybe treat you in a way that is disrespectful. And, and the, the easy thing for us to do is to give back in kind what was given to us. And David disrespected, said, well, you, you think you, you're going to do it with words. I'm going to do it with violence and force. That's not a good exchange, by the way, for Nabal. And it is it's something that, that all of us have to be aware of because, listen, we're not called to be led by our rash emotions, are we? As followers of Christ, we're, we're called to be led by the Spirit, not by our emotions. We're called to be led in faith by the Spirit of God and to respond in a way that is a godly response. And I would say David, in this moment of offense, is like an unyielding city. Like, I am coming to get you, Nabal. And there are times in our lives that we're going to be offended and we're going to rise up like David does in this story. And we're going to go, you know what? I'm gonna, you're, you're coming at me. I'm, I'm going to come at you two times, three times stronger than you could ever imagine. And yet, I think for us, the, the wisdom of Galatians 5, 22 and 23 is what we have to heed in a moment like this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, and peace, and forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things, there is no law. In a moment like that, you know, the Bible says we have to take every thought and make it captive to Christ. And when we want to react in a way, what we have to choose to do rather than responding rashly is to, to ask the question, Holy Spirit, what would you have me do? And we have to submit that to Christ. I, I promise you in this moment, David is acting out of passion. He is reacting out of offense. He's not thinking, God, what do you want me to do? Because most of the time when David would go into battle, he would go and inquire of the Lord as to whether he would find success in that battle or not. He does not do that here. What he does, though, is say, I'm ticked and I'm coming at you. Romans 12, 2, this is, again, for us to look at. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And I promise you that's not found in a rash response. A rash response, when I look back at my life and the times that I have ignored wisdom, I can tell you this, that, that it has not ended well. It has not ended the way that I hoped. And when we, when we go with a rash response, most of the time we're making a, a perhaps uh, choice that we will come to regret, regret rather over time. So we have to be aware, hey, it's gonna happen when you get offended, you're gonna rise up. But the choice is, God, what am I gonna do? Am I going to choose you? Am I going to choose restraint? Am I going to choose walking by your spirit? And the realization of this, I think this is, this is a great point for every marriage, every relationship we're in, that respect is the foundation of every relationship. That respect is the foundation of every relationship. Or we could frame it perhaps in another way. Honor is the answer. And this is where the beautiful story of Abigail begins to surface because a servant comes to Abigail and says, hey, you are not going to believe what Nabal just did. Like he totally told off David's men and uh, it, it's not good. First Samuel 25, 14 and 17 says this. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master and he spoke uh, and he spoke to them in anger. Yet the men were very good to us, and, they, and we were not harmed, and nor did anything go missing as long as they, we went with them. While we were in the fields, they were a wall to us both night and by day, all the time we were with them tending the sheep. In other words, they were incredible protectors. Now then be aware and consider what you should do. Because harm is plotted against our man's master and against all his household, and he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. Now, 
Abigail is married to Nabal. It's probably an arranged marriage. Most of the marriages at that point in time were, were arranged um, either politically or for gain or territorial gain or something along those lines. And so here you have this beautiful and intelligent Abigail, and she's married to a guy who's an incredible resource, but he's just, uh, just really not a good man. He's not a good person. And we, when you have a moment like that, I think... When you're in a relationship where there is a lack of respect and a lack of honor, there's, there's a lot of tension there. Like, I've been in context, I say this a lot, um, where, where you have unity, uh, and I've been in context where there is no unity. I've been in context in, in um, employment where there's tremendous unity, tremendous respect, tremendous honor, and been in context where there is no respect, there is no unity, there is no honor. And I promise you, 10 times out of 10 times, the one that demonstrates respect and honor and unity is 100% better than the one that does not. And respect is, is a foundation to every single relationship. And here, Nabal incredibly breaches that honor of, of any kind of respect given to somebody else. And now Abigail, in her wisdom, has to figure out what she has to do to save his, you know what? To save his life, to save his resource. And the servant comes and you're, you're not gonna believe, Nabal's doing what Nabal does. And Abigail, now it's up to you to kind of do what you do and let the wisdom of, of your uh, thinking jump in. So this is what she does. Then Abigail hurried and took a hundred, lo 200 rather, loaves of bread and 200 jugs, that's a lot of wine, 200 jugs of wine and five sheep already prepared and five measures of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisins, 200 cakes of figs. And she loaded them on donkeys. And then she said to, to her young man, go on ahead of me. Behold, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal, she came up with a plan, realizing the offense that her husband has given. First Samuel 25 and 20, uh, 20 through 23, and it happened as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain that behold, David and his men were coming down toward her and she met them. Now David had said, it is certainly for nothing that I have guarded everything that, that this man has in the wilderness so that nothing has gone missing of all that belonged to him. For he has returned me evil for good. May God do so to the enemies of David and more so if by morning I leave alive as much as one male of anyone who belonged to him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her horse or her donkey and fell on her face in front of David and bowed herself to the ground. Again, Abigail knew who Nabal was and here she is about to rescue him. Think about what David is saying here. He is enraged and on his way to destroy everything that this man has ever had. She knew what she needed to do. I think there's a moment for all of our lives where we understand that wisdom walks with tact and timing. It's not just the right thing to say, it's the right time to say that thing. I have gotten that wrong plenty of times. Have you ever been in an argument and you know that you are right? It's the right thing to say in your mind. But the timing, perhaps, Wisdom is understanding the tact and the timing, and Abigail nails it. She cuts him off at the pass before he can get to the town. She comes, and essentially she repents for the sin of her husband Nabal. And she goes before David, having prepared a ton of resource that he should have gotten, his men should have walked away with what she brings to David. And she gets off the horse, and she, she or off the donkey rather, and she pleads with David for grace. She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, listen to this, listen how she bears the responsibility for her husband's poor decisions. On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your slave speak to you and listen to the words of your slave. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to the worthless man, Nabal, which is probably not a really nice thing to say about your husband, but you know, for his namesake, she's just saying, this is his name, this is who he is. And stupidity is with him. That's kind of harsh, huh? But it is what it is. 
But I, your slave, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your, your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then may your enemies and those who seek evil against the Lord be like Nabal. And now let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to you, to the young men who accompany my Lord. Please forgive the offense of your slave, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. She knows where he's going because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord and evil will be not found in you all of your days. Should anyone rise up and pursue you and seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God, but the lives of your enemies will sling out as far of the, as a hollow of the sling. And so David in this moment responds to Abigail's wisdom and her tact. She brings the resource that her husband failed to bring. She brings a spirit, a contrite spirit, not a haughty spirit. A spirit seeking forgiveness and reconciliation because she knew who David was as Nabal knew who David was. But she also knew what David was about to do. And she pleads and begs with wisdom, with timing, with tact, and with a gift to say, Dave, we're, we're so sorry. It's, it's my fault this happened. Will you forgive us? And the beautiful thing is that David receives the offering. He receives the wisdom of Abigail. I think it's interesting as well, because if you read this chapter 25, it talks about the evil that would have been done, the evil that would have, the evil that David was going to do, the evil that because he chose not to, he's not stained by this evil. That God in the course brings an Abigail to interrupt his wrath decision, his impulsive and passionate decision that would have led to a stained rain. It would have led to something that was an evil on the record of David. And Abigail in her timing and her tact and her wisdom cuts off this moment. And David even recognized, hey, you've, you've prevented me. You've saved me from an evil thing. And God has used you, Abigail, to prevent me from doing evil. And the story moves on. It gets even a little more interesting, Abigail, because Abigail goes back and Nabal was partying as Nabal was evidently prone to do. They were having the shearing party of the, of, of the, the time and they were excited and drinking and all the rest. And she gets back and Nabal's not in a condition for her to talk to him about what she had done. And so the next day she goes to Nabal and says, hey, Nabal, I saved you. Just so you know, David was coming here to kill you and every single one of you and plunder your resources, but I saved you. This is what I did. And the Bible says that Nabal's heart turned to stone. And guess what happens? 10 days later, Nabal drops dead. I'd say it's good to have God fighting your battles for you. God protects David, and then God deals with the offense himself in this situation. But it gets even more interesting because David hears about Nabal's demise and Abigail finds herself in front of David once again. And in that moment, David receives Abigail to be one of his wives. So this wise and beautiful, intelligent woman who is connected to this really awful guy because she honored David instead of going along and just saying, well, what could I do? She chose to act with wisdom. She chose to, to bring an offering. And because she did, she saves Nabal's life. She stood up, stood, stood up in protection of the household, even though she knew the man was wrong. And then God, 10 days later, just deals with it. And her story is a happily ever after being wed to David. Listen, for our lives, there's some warnings in this beautiful story of Abigail, a forgotten figure oftentimes in scripture and, and Nabal as well, often forgotten. That we need to live with a contrite and humble heart. That we need to Make sure that in our decision-making, we don't 
become rash and impulsive and passionate, especially when we are offended. That we realize that respect and honor are a foundation for every relationship. And if we have a problem in any relationship, if we will bring respect and honor back into the equation, God can likely do a work in that. Not every time will that be the case because two people have to work together. But that wisdom has timing and tact. And we apply those things to our relationships in the here and now. God is able to, to use us the way he did Abigail to perhaps protect somebody from going off an edge that they didn't see coming. And I just want to encourage each and every one of us today as we remember these forgotten lives, let's not forget the lessons that their lives can bring us each and every one. And I really want to pray this morning. I, I, I feel like for those who are maybe in a relationship dynamic, where it's been really hard, really difficult, and that you're just believing for the wisdom of heaven in that relationship. And I'll really say this, if it's, if it's a relationship that is not built on godly principles, it's a relationship that probably shouldn't exist the way it's existing right now. And so that you, we've got to evaluate some of those things and, and ask the question, does this line up with what the Bible teaches? Does this line up with, with what his best is for my life? Sometimes we, we hit a wall in our relationships and we just keep on doing the same thing and wondering why we don't get different results. And we're like, why? Well, I, I want the blessing. I want the goodness. I want the favor of God in my relationship, but I want to ignore all these principles. But guess what? It doesn't work that way. We can't just ignore everything about the Bible and everything that God gives us in, instruction in his word and expect, just, and expect just the blessing to be there because God is good and kind. We actually need to submit. We need to come under the cover of what his principles give us to choose that and to walk in that with wisdom, with grace, with honor, with respect for one another in our relationships, making sure we're making wise choices. But I do want to pray today, if you are in a relationship dynamic that you're just challenged, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. You know who you are, you know what the di that dynamic is, but I do wanna pray for you. I'm gonna ask every head to be bowed and every one to be praying, but Father, we just thank you today. We hear the echo of Abigail and Nabal today as it echoes into our present time and reality. And Lord, right now, we just pray for those who are maybe in a, in a conflict situation, in a relationship situation, they don't know exactly how to handle it. Lord, I pray that today, you would speak so very clearly to their life and to their heart. God, that you today would speak with clarity over that situation. God, that you would give them the wisdom from heaven, that they would test it against scripture, God, that they would look and evaluate and get wise, biblical, godly counsel. And Lord, we pray that the wisdom that they need, that you are able to provide in Jesus' name. Lord, we come against every edge, every attack of the enemy on relationships and on marriages. Lord, we, we come against what the enemy wants to do in separating families, God, and tearing them apart. Lord, we come against what the enemy wants to do in and Lord, we just pray today that we would hear your voice, that we would hear your encouragement, and we would walk in your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen.